as an outstanding ecologic environment, very different from the world average, a very fertile soil, endless supply of water, no major uh, geographical obstacles, no mountain, no desert. So the only problem of the Dutch was to control uh, the water flows, which they did with good success. Now, you wouldn't be able to do that in the places where uh, Tim Dyson was working in the middle of uh, India, nor where I was working in the salient part of Africa. There is no water there, so uh, you wouldn't have the, the same uh, problems, of course. Um, if you go to mountains, if you go to uh, arid areas, you will have a very different problem. Uh, of course, you expect very uh, different uh, population densities. Um, now, there is another argument about Holland is that uh, the more problems you have to solve, the, um, the more you, solutions you will find. But if you look at all the places in the world where you have a similar environment, I mean, the deltas of the big rivers, you take the Ganga Brahmaput River in, in uh, Bengal, you take the Nile Delta in, uh, in Egypt, you take the Niger Delta in Nigeria, this has never happened. Uh, only uh, here in Holland, people were able to uh, uh, have this uh, in incredible innovation uh, in techniques that uh, made uh, possible the population growth on a small uh, piece of land. Um, so um, uh, that the argument developed by Esther Bosserup and a number of other people that the uh, higher population density leads to innovation, but I think that's been wrong in most of the cases that uh, over the last 50 years, uh, 5,000 years, excuse me, so for a very, very long time. Uh, we still are facing the, the limitation of uh, uh, that Malthus described the carrying capacity of the land and also the management of the economy. Oh, well, I'm doing in time, yeah, fine, okay. Um, next question that I would like to raise today is what happens beyond food limits? I mean, uh, Malthus was uh, focusing always on food and all the, the societies that he had studied had a major uh, problem with food, whether it was in the uh, uh, in, uh, in the northern of Europe, uh, in the Siberia, and he studied everything he could, uh, in, he could find in uh, the Americas, in uh, Oceania, and everywhere. But um, the nature between the relationship between the population and environment has been changing very quickly in the recent past as a result of the population explosion. So there are new limits appearing now for plants, for land animals, and for fishes. Luckily, uh, so far, we have been able to find sol new solutions, increasing leak for plants, raising animals in factories, and developing fish farms. But the li limits have been pushed forward, but they still exist. Um, now, water, water is becoming a major issue in about half of the world, and not here, that's for sure. But if you go to Africa and most places, to uh, South Asia and many places, to even to Latin America and some places, uh, uh, water is becoming a major issue uh, uh, for the, uh, the population. Uh, not only because of the population explosion, of course, but also because of the increasing demand for agriculture and in some uh, cases for the industry. Um, the demand for energy is also increasing dramatically. The fossil, fossil fuels are limited and other sources of energy are either very expensive or are in competition with agriculture. And the land space is limited and it's becoming, again, a source of conflicts. A century ago in Africa, land was still available. I mean, if you didn't have land here, you would move 50 kilometers away and you will find free land. Huh? And it was free for migrants and settlers. This is no longer the case. It's finished in any part of the world like, with a very, very few exceptions. Um, uh, next slide, please. So here we are reaching the core of the new relationship between population and development, and population and environment. We are reaching a stage where any large change affects the global ec uh, ecological equilibrium. And this global dimension is new. At the time when what this, what this book, all the limitations were local, they were not global. I listed here a few of the major issues, and this came again in Tim's presentation. The greenhouse effect induced by human activity, which is the main source of global warming, and which has so many consequences for the environment. The land degradation and pollution as a consequence of uh, overutilization and industrial cultures. The negative health impact uh, for humans, as well as for animals of fertilizers and pesticides necessary to meet the demand for food, as well as the toxic wastes pro produced by the industry. I would like also to mention the price of land, uh, which has been increasing very quickly and is likely to increase even more in the future. 
In some places, the price of land for housing is so high that no one can afford to buy a piece of land with an average income. You need an extremely high income in order to, to be able to uh, acquire a piece of land, which was not the case uh, a century ago. Agricultural land is also becoming an issue for many of our populated uh, countries, such as China, Japan, Korea, or Saudi Arabia. And these countries are now buying or renting land in other countries, which raise numerous political issues, as exemplified by the recent coup d'etat in Madagascar. So there are now major trade-offs that uh, we have to face, and which necessitate difficult choices. <coughs> trade-off between arable land and rainforest, between land for food and land for energy production, food crops versus animal farming, increasing production versus safe environment, and space for wildlife versus space for humans. Mm -hmm. Now, I go often to South Africa, and I'm very much fascinated by the space that's still available for wildlife in this part of the world. And this is possible only because of the relatively low population density. Yeah? Now, this has almost disappeared in Europe. If one wants to introduce a family of bears or wolves in France, this becomes a national issue and almost impossible technically. So, totally different side of the problem. Uh, new and very important issues have emerged in the recent years. Any change has an effect on global ecological equilibrium. And for instance, an increasing arable land implies the destruction of the rainforest, which implies increasing emission of carbon dioxide, which implies global warming and has many adverse consequences. So if one considers all the basic constraints on human life mentioned above, do we have any solution compatible with increasing population, increasing income, increasing uh, demand for goods and energy as defined by the North American way of life. Uh, I doubt we have, and this was said already in the um, uh, uh, Club of Rome uh, report uh, some uh, uh, 45 years ago. Uh, it's an interesting report. A colleague of mine went uh, back to this report and tried to uh, compare what did happen in the last 40 years since the report was done with what they wrote in 1972. And most of what they wrote was right. I and mean, uh, we, are, we are just uh, uh, seeing the beginning of the problems um, that they have described. Next slide. Next, slide. Um, next, last, uh, next question, politics of population control. Well, I think there have been uh, major <coughs> changes in the relationship between developed and developing countries. Uh, in the 1950s, when the population debate started, it was centered around the will of the North, namely the U USA and its allies to control the population of the South. And it was mainly at that time Latin America, Asia, and Africa. And this happened, unfortunately, in the context of uh, imperialism, decolonization, communism, Cold War, and was therefore heavily politicized. This is most unfortunate since there are mostly common interests uh, that, that we see now and not any longer uh, any major conflict in interest. Attitudes and behavior toward low, low, towards low fertility tended to converge in the recent years. The world has become a global village with common economic and ecological constraints, and the new ecology, ecological issues and their consequences are also becoming global, in particular global warming. So far, uh, going back again to the transition, we have been lucky to have dedicated people in the USA who, around 1950, started to address the issue of population control. Without, without them, we'll be in a much worse situation and will not have had the, 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 the stabilizing population by year 2050 that the United Nations is 